Good morning. In a few minutes, uh, Mark Stromberg will be coming forward. And I just wanted to say a few words about Mark before uh, he did that. Um, those of you that were at the annual meeting have heard some of this already, so bear with me. But I think it's important that the congregation knows um, what a resource we have uh, in our Northwest Conference. And I just want you all to know that I've worked with a lot of people over the years, and I don't think I've ever worked with anyone more dedicated than Mark Stromberg. Um, Mark, uh, we talked for hours on the phone over the last year. Um, Mark was, uh, um, I mean, he would talk to me, uh, of course, during office hours. He'd talk to me uh, evenings. Uh, he'd even talk to me on his vacation. So that just shows the dedication he has. Uh, the other thing, you know, he was always a resource for us. Uh, he always answered our questions, but he was always had a very clear line where um, he never told us what to do. He would answer our questions and, and help us in any way he could, but was always uh, the decisions he left to us. And uh, I, I just, uh, I tell you, in the last year, Mark, I've come to appreciate you so much. And I just, from the search committee, I just want to say thank you very much for what you've done for us in the last year. Good morning. My name is Chris Pappenfuss. I will soon be one of the pastors on this staff here. Very excited about that. But it is our privilege this morning to come to God's word and let us have ears to hear as we read together from 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know. Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up and struck the water with it, and the water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, but if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garments and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord? 
the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Friends, the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Great to be here and to be able to share in this special day with you. I have to tell you, and many of you probably don't experience this because most of us tend to sometimes want to sit towards the back, but to sit up front here and listen to your singing is really wonderful. And uh, you sound like you truly are a singing congregation, and it was just wonderful to hear all of the voices. Steve, thanks to you and your team for leading in worship. But I mean, just the, the, the sound of the congregation, oftentimes as a pastor and you're sitting in the front row, you tend to hear the, the people up front the most. Uh, but today I will have to say I heard the people behind me the most, and that was a, a wonderful experience. I'm also glad to come to Installation Sundays because I, I know generally there will be a good crowd. You know, sometimes when I... Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like the story of the, uh, the, the bishop that came into a sanctuary that sat a thousand people, and there were only about 40 people in the sanctuary. And he was irate. And he whispered to the pastor on the platform, he said, didn't you tell him I was coming? And the pastor said, no, but they must have found out anyway. <laughs> and so this is... There are times when I'll just worship in one of our churches just to worship. And the response I usually get is not, oh, welcome, but what are you doing here? Like they figure something's, uh, something's amiss. But, uh, but glad to be here for this great celebration today for Chris and Allison and their family. And again, I've heard this morning, Pap and Foos, including that's what Chris said, remember that. I've heard Pap and Fuss. Uh, I've heard all kinds of things. So just think of foosball. See, this will be the way that'll help you. Think of foosball, Pap and Foos, then you'll get it right. But grateful to be here. And Gary, uh, thanks for your, where's Gary here all of a sudden? Dolberg. Oh, okay, <laughs> we're sitting in the back, that's good. Uh, but thanks for your, uh, I'm, I'm just glad you're here. That would have been awkward for both of us if you had to, well, I've done my part. I'm out of here. Um, but thanks for your gracious words. And uh, it's been a privilege to work with you, Gary, and uh, the search committee. And, uh, you know, this is a significant uh, role that you entrust to a search committee. And it's not an easy role. And uh, so grateful, Gary, also to work with you and, and uh, the humility in your leadership. So thanks, and thanks again for your gracious words to me. Well, uh, some of you have heard me say this before. I'm a, a child of the Northwest Conference. The Northwest Conference, it sounds like we should be in Seattle or Portland, and here we are in the middle of the country. But we're one of the oldest regional conferences for the Evangelical Covenant Church. We have about 145 churches in Minnesota. North Dakota, South Dakota, and Western Wisconsin. And we had a whole group of churches that predate the covenant. I grew up at First Covenant, downtown Minneapolis. In fact, by the way, when I went to seminary initially at North Park, they'd say, what church are you from? I'd say, First Covenant. I didn't realize that half the guys there were from First Covenants, just around the country, different places. But, but I had an opportunity to grow up here uh, within the, the Northwest Conference. We're actually named the Northwest Conference because of the age of some of our churches going all the way back into the late 1860s. Uh, it was, we were really named after the Northwest Territories. And so it was a group of churches that came in and helped initially form the Evangelical Covenant Church. At the time, uh, was not called that, but the Swedish Covenant Church, and uh, this was Swedish Mission Covenant Church, actually, uh, back in 1885. We also have five Bible camps. I had the privilege last weekend of preaching up at Covenant Blue Water, which is our camp for our northern Minnesota churches, Red River Valley and up around International Falls, celebrating their 50th. But we have five different Bible camps. Uh, we have Minnehaha Academy in town, which this last year won both the uh, baseball uh, state boys championship as well as the basketball championship. So that's pretty amazing uh, for one school, uh, any school of any size, to win two state championships. Uh, I had the privilege of attending Minnehaha Academy. I came to faith in Christ at Covenant Pines Bible Camp, uh, having grown up at First Covenant downtown Minneapolis. And my second year of Trailblazer Camp, I was sitting over, if this was the chapel at Covenant Pines, I was sitting in the second row back, 
and there's windows on this side in the lake, and uh, the, 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 the speaker, and I don't remember if it was a, a pastor or a missionary, but the speaker said, someday God is going to call some of you into full-time Christian service. When I was a kid, that's kind of how it was framed. Someday God's going to call some of you into full-time Christian service, and as a second-year trailblazer, I remember looking out the window and thinking, that's me. And I don't know, I wasn't necessarily a well-behaved boy. I had uh, too much energy, um, but I, I just knew. And I knew that I knew. And I knew that I knew that I knew. And it was, it was almost like having an adult brain in a little boy's body just for like two seconds. And then I went back to messing around with my friends again. But just for that moment, I had this moment of clarity. And so to this day, if I go up to Covenant Pines and speak, I'll go sit in the same spot. I was 50, I, I suppose I was 10 or 11 years old, whatever you are, I'm 61. It was 50 years ago, can't believe it. And I sit in the same spot and I look out the window and it comes back to me uh, just like yesterday. And so I have benefited from the wonderful things that can take place when churches join together. We say about the Northwest Conference that we exist to serve our churches on such things as search committees. By the way, during this last year, we've been working with 16 pastoral search, lead pastoral search committees besides staff search committees. Um, but we, we exist to serve our churches, but we also exist, and this is important, to unite our churches together in service. Because there are some things that are best done when we join together. Bible camps. Think of the influence of Bible camps, not just on kids, but on so many, so many of us that are older that were influenced. Where would we be without our Bible camps? And yet we have camps, why? Because multiple churches join together and say, let's have a camp. Even our most well-heeled churches don't say, you know, we're going to buy 200 acres and build buildings and have a full-time staff year-round, but when we join together, we're able to have our camps. This morning, uh, Dan May mentioned Moose. Uh, and, and you think of MOVE and Adventures in Leadership, and you think of Chick, you think of these various camping and, and other retreat settings where, where we're able to gather junior high or middle high or senior high kids together. Churches can't pull that off. But when we join together, these are impactful events for our young people. Think of the supporting of missionaries. And the Dolans would know this who are here this morning. I, I just found out that you are their godson. So this is wonderful. But, but how is it that we are able to send missionaries? We're able to send missionaries because churches join together and pool resources. Prayer support, volunteer support. You have people going to Alaska. Um, but all of these things, finances, and we're able to send missionaries. Where we would, be, would we be if we did not join together in a covenant relationship? Where would we be? Planting of churches. How would we ever plant churches and start new churches? And by the way, you know, on Minnesota Public Radio, it says this, remember that all music was once new? Think about this. Remember, all churches were once new. This was a baby church once upon a time. And the only reason it exists is because there were other people that poured resources to be able to have this church come to being. So, so what does that mean for us in terms of playing that, paying that forward? Saying even as people helped us get going, what obligation do we have then to try to help other works have more babies? All these things we're able to do better when we join together. So we exist to serve our churches, but we also exist to unite our churches together in service for the Lord because we are better together. Well, there are two other uh, people that were better together. And uh, this morning, uh, Pastor Chris read the text about them, Elijah and Elisha. When I was a kid, I wish they had been named Fred and Steve. It would have been easier to keep them separate. But just remember, J comes before S. Now you'll always remember this. So Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, the elder prophet, the statesman, if you will, um, one who had proclaimed the word of God to the people, but also his young friend, his student, the one he had mentored all along, Elisha. Oh, there were many other young prophets in Israel, Israel we are told, but it is clear that Elisha was to take the place of Elijah rather than any of the others. 
And so it seems appropriate on their last day together, Elijah knowing that he would be taken from Elisha, that they went out for a walk. Elijah the elder, the teacher, and Elisha, the student, the successor. And Elijah asks him a question. He says this, what can I do for you before I leave, in essence? I want to be of continued help to you. But because you are the one who is going to carry on in my inevitable absence, what is it that I can do for you before I depart? And Elisha's response seems to have startled the elder prophet. And what he asked was as big a compliment or an affirmation of Elijah's work as there could have been. Verse 9, it says this, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. I want to be like you, Elijah. In fact, I want to be like you more than you are like you. Well, they continued to walk and talk. Last minute instructions. Parents, uh, for some of us, think about sending your kids off to college. Maybe saying things like, well, you know what? You maybe don't need to hear me say this, but I have to say it anyway. That kind of thing. Or we always say to our kids or our loved ones, drive carefully, as if we think they aren't going to try to drive carefully. We need to say these things. Last minute instructions, probably. Words of affection and appreciation, no doubt. But then in the midst of their sweet and melancholy fellowship, we're told that Elijah was taken on a chariot of fire. And we're also told that Elisha received his heart's desire. He was given Elijah's mantle. In fact, it says that he tore his own clothes in two. It's kind of like, I'm done with this. And he picked up the mantle, the symbol of all that power and authority that had been Elijah's through the year. And Elisha, he picked it up and he claimed it as his own heritage. And he immediately went forward with it to demonstrate its effectiveness for a new generation. My friends in Christ, it is that mantle on this Installation Sunday that I want us to consider just for a few moments. And though that material article, meaning the actual mantle, is long gone, still it is reflective of things that are very important for us as we consider this text. And, and I'd like for us to consider one question. It's this. What did the mantle represent? It's not just a piece of clothing, obviously. What did it represent? First, it represented succession. It represented succession. You see, when Elisha saw that the mantle lay at his own feet, he knew without a doubt that he had been called to succeed Elijah, to pick up and carry on where Elijah had left off. That God had appointed him with the task of being the new Elijah for his generation, for a younger generation in the continued leading of God's people. It represented succession, but it also represented strength. You see, Elijah was a strong person. And by that, we don't know, we don't know, or don't mean necessarily that he was buff. But we do know that he was full of conviction. He was full of power. He was persuasive. He had resolve. He persevered. He was resilient. He had zeal. Speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus says in Luke 1 17, it says that he has the meaning John, has the spirit and what? The power of Elijah to turn people from their sins, to, to, to turn the hearts of people. You see, Elijah, this mantle represented strength. His character, there was an impression of, of power, something massive about Elijah, his devotion to God and to his people. And this was a strength incumbent upon Elisha to emulate. Well, what did the mantle represent? It represented succession. It represented strength. One last thing. It represented, most importantly, the Spirit of God. It represented the Spirit of God. In verse 9, when Elisha asks for the Spirit of Elijah, there's more to it than simply wanting to be like another person. Rather, it is he wants what the other person has. What made the other person who the other person was. This is more than like the old Nike commercial where it said, be like Mike. It's more than that. 
In fact, he needed what the older prophet had because that is what made the big difference in the older prophet's life, the spirit of the living God. It was like Elisha was saying, Elijah, I want to be like you. Why? Because you have seen God. And because God dwells in you. And I want, no, I need him to dwell in me if I'm actually supposed to carry on in your stead. Succession, strength, spirit of God. Well, this isn't just an object lesson, this mantle about Elijah and Elisha. You see, this is for us today. This is certainly for Pastor Chris, but it's for each and every one of us as we name the name of Jesus Christ and seek to follow and serve God. You see, all of us, what? We stand in a great line of succession. There have been many who have come before us and faithfully proclaimed the word of God. And I'm not just talking about pastors here. Think of all the Sunday school teachers. Think of all the people that have worked in the trenches through the years. This this line of succession. But you know, they too, like Elijah, have passed from this earthly scene, or maybe they've just moved away, leaving us with the responsibility of being the prophetic voice for this generation and we are compelled to carry on in their place 1978 one of my grandmas her name was Mabel Larson so all my relatives are Larson Erickson Stromberg Hansen you get you get the you kind of get the gist of where my ancestors came from but Mabel Larson she was about this big my sweet little grandma Mabel grandma Larson And she was dying, and she was at North Memorial. It was North Memorial Hospital at the time, but Medical Center in Robbinsdale in the Twin Cities. And she lined up all of the grandkids in order of age, and it was almost like it also looked like this in terms of size for the most part, except the guys sometimes would be up a little bit from the the girls. But lined us up, and she called us in one at a time and talked to us individually, prayed for us, and gave us a blessing. It was almost like something out of the Old Testament. And we're standing out in the hall. I was uh, 21 years old, I guess, at the time. And, you know, it started with my my oldest sister, who was the oldest of the grandkids, down to my my youngest uh, cousin, and came in one at a time. In fact, what she shared with us was so special and unique, none of us really shared it with each other for many, many years. It was almost like this is our personal treasure from Grandma Larson. So it was my turn to come in, and I came in, and she talked to me and expressed how much she loved me. But, but similar to this, kind of last-minute instructions. And then she said to me, um, Mark, and she said something, and I, you know, you're kind of a younger kid, so I, I suppose I wasn't really looking at her, or, you know, and, was, and I knew she was passing away, and I loved my grandma. And so I probably was kind of half looking around the room and not, she goes, Mark, look at me. Look into my eyes. And she said this to me. You always be a Jesus man. That's how she put it. You always be a Jesus man. And I started to cry and I looked at her and I said, Grandma, I vow to you, I promise, I will always be a Jesus man. I will always be a Jesus man. And you know what's interesting? There have been times in my life since then that the thought, forgive me for this, it's just the truth, the thought of Jesus has not necessarily kept me from any particular sin, but the thought of my grandma has. Isn't that interesting? Or or the thought of a Sunday school teacher that I had had for years who loved me and, and expected the best from me and expected me to follow through on my commitments. The thought of them, I thought, I cannot, I cannot, I will not disappoint them. I won't. I will not turn against them with all they did in my life. So again, we talk about sometimes Jesus having skin, other people. Isn't that interesting? You always be a Jesus man. In other words, it's kind of like, Mark, remember what you've learned and from whom it was learned. Pick up the mantle and move on and live it. By the way, I'm not the only person in the room to have experiences. doesn't have to be like that. But other kinds of experiences where, where you just had these moments of clarity where you say, nope, this is where I stand. 
I have to stand here. I will not stand anywhere else. Think of Scripture in 2 Timothy 1. What is Timothy told? Remember what you learned from your mother Eunice and your grandma Lois. What's Paul doing? He's kind of putting that same pressure on a little bit to Timothy maybe. Remember what you learned, but also remember who you learned it from. You learned it from mom and you learned it from grandma. And maybe many of you could recount something similar, a sense that you were being asked to carry on in God's name. Why? Because we all stand in that great line of succession. You as a church stand in the great line of succession. And we must be faithful to our calling. And you know, Pastor Chris, you stand in the great line of succession. Somewhere I'm sure in this building are pictures of pastors. In fact, I know there is. And you can look and realize, you know what, I'm not the first. And barring the Lord's return, I'm not going to be the last. But I'm asked for this moment to pick up the mantle and to be faithful. But you know, secondly, we must seek to be obedient because those who have given us this message have been strong. Therefore, we are called upon to be strong. Isn't it interesting? The Bible commands us to be strong. Um, it's kind of like we want to say, well, I'm not. And yet it's, it's a command as if we have some level of control over it. It doesn't mean to not have fear, uh, but it means to be bold in the Lord. Sometimes we think if you say be strong, it's like saying be athletic. Well, I'm doing the best I can whether I am or not. But the Bible tells us to be strong. And, and those who preceded us were strong. And were asked upon to emulate their strength, their courage, their conviction, their sacrifice. Think of your church. Again, think of Sunday school teachers. Think of church chair people. Think of leadership teams that have had to make difficult decisions in the past, sometimes getting hammered for it. And not even being able to really, you know, exactly st say why they made the decisions they did. You know, it's not easy to, to take hits that are unfair. And, and believe me, as superintendent, there are times I know this. You know, the narrative, the false narratives that start, you have no control over them, and you just have to kind of take it. But that's the price of leadership. That's the price of having to be strong in the midst of difficult decisions, uh, ministry focus, Decisions made by people who persevered, people who sacrificed even for your building here. Some of you, people full of conviction and zealous. This is, this is an incredible thing, what we have been handed by others. After my parents died, my, uh, one of my grandpas, now my grandpa Stromberg, um, I, I found a, a cardboard tube that had a big tube, had a certificate, and I took it out, opened it up, never heard about this or seen it before. I knew he had taught junior high boys Sunday school down at First Covenant, but here's what it said on it. His name was Marcel. It doesn't sound very Swedish, but Marcelinus Stromberg, and it said this. It was signed by Dr. Paul Rees, who was a pastor when I was a little boy down there. It said this. Marcelinus Stromberg, he had taught junior high boys Sunday school for 44 years. Okay, but now get this. And then in quote marks, in, in then italic print, in quote marks it said, perfect attendance. My grandpa did not miss Sunday school for 44 years. I was like, what? I mean, we can't even comprehend that. But you know, he wasn't alone. You look back at people that mortgaged their homes to build buildings, the, the sacrifice, we have no clue. You know, we think we sacrifice, and some of us maybe do some, but maybe not like the way some people had to sacrifice years ago. This is incredible. And we've been given this from strong people. Therefore, we are asked to imitate their strength, imitate the strength of those who have preceded us. Well, we stand in the great line of succession. Uh, it's been given to us by the gospel message, the mantle, by people who are strong and resolute. But then one thing further, the Spirit of God. For in our lives, is precisely that's what's needed, our need being no less than it was in the day of Elijah and Elisha. Maybe it's even more needed. You see, they were witnesses of the Lord in evil times, and so are we. They, they were witnesses for the Lord on the one hand in prosperous times, but, but also volatile times. Well, just look around. 
They lived in days when apostasy and religious faith and immorality in society were widespread, where people liked teachers who would tickle their ears and yet not really be saying the truth of the word of God. So do we. And you know what? Those servants of God needed to have something more in order to arrest and arouse sin-hardened hearts than cold theology or shallow reforms or even a stellar strategy or brilliant oratory. They had to have the released and relevant power of the living God, the authority of the supernatural, the fire of the Spirit, as well as fire in their bellies, and so do we. And Pastor Chris, so do you. And my friends, there's no way for us to possess these spiritual qualifications any more than there was for them, except as we ourselves are surrendered to and possessed by this wonderful, powerful Spirit of God. We used to sing, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. And as a church, this should be our prayer. And this should be the prayer for your pastor. You see, Elisha merited the mantle for he saw his own desperate need for the power of God in his life to make a difference. And we know it's the power of God. Think about this. We think that a little guy can make a decision to follow Christ, that a little girl can make a decision to follow Christ, that God, through his Holy Spirit, can work in their lives even when they're little, that, that a little child can make the biggest decision of their entire life. It's more important than what they do for a living, where they live, who they marry, who their friends are, and that is they can say yes to God. Now they have to continue to live in it, but they can make that decision. These same little kids, we would not let them stay in the house by themselves for an hour if we and our spouse went out for supper. We wouldn't do that. And yet somehow we think they can make the biggest decision of their life. That shows that we understand, even if we're not always cognizant of it, that we believe that the Holy Spirit of God can do a powerful work and that it's beyond us. It's deeper and greater than us. It defies our understanding. Well, we've been handed the mantle of succession. It's been handed to us by strong and courageous people. Do we understand the need for the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to fulfill the tasks required for us to do? You know, Chris, today you are being given this mantle. And uh, we need you to be an Elisha today. You're just starting out. You're just picking up the mantle. And we, we pray on one hand that you're an Elisha for all your years here and pick up the mantle for however long God gives you in this place. But friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, my prayer for your congregation is that in time, Chris becomes your Elijah or an Elijah to you in other words, calling out younger people still, encouraging them and mentoring them and challenging them with the gospel message and reminding them that God may be calling them in their lives to serve in courageous and powerful ways. So on the one hand, Pastor Chris is Elisha picking up the mantle, but on the other hand, may he become Elijah, particularly among your younger people and your children that will carry the gospel message on to a newer generation still. You know, this is, a, this is joyful business, but this is also very serious business, isn't it, that we're involved in. It's holy and it's sacred. But Chris and Allison, may God bless you, and may God bless your family. Merit the mantle, not because of who you are, not because of where you've been, not because of what you've done, but because of whose you are and what God has done for you. Merit the mantle, and may the Lord give you a double portion to carry on the task before you. Amen. Dear friends, guided by the Holy Spirit, you've called Chris Papenfus to be your pastor. By this act, you have indicated your confidence in him to be the shepherd of this congregation. I charge you to receive the word of God through him in all meekness and love. Undergird him in the labors that will be his in the service of God. 
Remember always that he is God's servant and that you as God's stewards are to supply his needs, but also the needs of his entire family in a way that is both pleasing to God and honoring to your congregation. In all things, show him your love, esteem him highly for his calling as your pastor and accept him as your spiritual leader. If these are your intentions, please support him now in the continuing ministry of this church by standing and responding to the following questions. Will you receive Chris Papenfus to be your pastor, recognizing his place in spiritual leadership and receiving the word of God through him? If this is your promise, answer, we will. And will you do your full part to supply his needs and the needs of his family in a way that is pleasing to God? And will you encourage him and share with him in the work of Christ in this church? If this is your promise, answer, we will. You may be seated. And now what gifts do you bring as symbols of this new ministry? Pastor Chris, come on up. Bible and be among us as one who preaches and teaches the good news of God's saving work in Christ. Accept this water. Oh. And be among us. Take this water and be among us who baptizes in obedience to our Lord. Chris, take this bread in this cup and be among us to break this bread and bless the cup. Receive this book and be among us as one who leads us in the worship of God. Chris, receive this oil and be among us as a minister of God's healing and, uh, and, uh, reconciliation. and reconciliation. Pastor Chris, take this wash basin and be among us. Let's uh, join us in sacrificial service. And Chris, let all these be signs of the ministry that is yours in this place. Dear brother in Christ, hear the word of God is directed to ministers of the church of Jesus Christ. In Acts 20, it says this, Take heed to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you a guardian to feed the church of the Lord, which he obtained with his own blood. Ephesians 4, it says this, God, by his Holy Spirit, calls men and women to serve him and his church according to the gifts he has given to them. We read in the scriptures, and these were his gifts, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip God's people for work in his service to the building up of the body of Christ. And then 1 Timothy 4, be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless and silly myths. Train yourself in godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Chris, you've been called by this congregation to be its pastor. God and this congregation have committed the shepherding of this flock to you, and you are admonished by God to be urgent in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, 
administer the sacraments in all sincerity, preach the word of God in accordance with the scriptures, comfort and counsel the sick, the sorrowing and the troubled, and instruct all to live up to their calling in Christ Jesus. Are you willing to assume this responsibility in the strength that God has given you? If so, please say, by the grace of God, I am. By the grace of God. And in assuming your responsibility as pastor of this congregation, will you reaffirm your loyalty to the Evangelical Covenant Church and promise to support its work and the work of the Northwest Conference? If so, please say, by the grace of God, I will. I'd like to invite Allison and kiddos to come forward. And I'm going to invite the folks on the platform to gather around. And then those of you who are, I know some are out of town, but if you were on the pastoral search committee or in other positions of leadership, if you would also just come forward right now and gather around the Papenfuss family. And we're going to share in a responsive prayer. I, th uh, I think the words are going to be up on the screen, but you also, yes, but you also have them in your uh, bulletins on the back side of the worship order, I believe. And I will read the first part, and then we will uh, join together reading the second. And if some would lay hands on the Papenfuss family. Let's pray. Almighty God, in every age you have chosen servants to proclaim your word and lead your people. We give thanks for your servant, Chris, whom you have called to serve in this place. By your grace, enable him to use his gifts to do your work and fill him with your Holy Spirit so that he may have the mind of Christ and be your faithful servant as long as he lives. Altogether, God of grace, who calls us to a common ministry as ambassadors of Christ, entrusting us with the message of reconciliation, Give us courage and discipline to follow where your servants rightly lead us, that together we may declare your wonderful deeds and show your love to the world through Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church and by the authority of this congregation and the Northwest Conference, I now declare that Chris Papenfus is duly installed as pastor of this congregation. Let us continue to pray that God may be pleased to sanctify with God's heavenly blessing the relationship of pastor and people that has now been established in Jesus' name. Let's give the Papenfuss family a hand. We want to continue to respond to the call, the charge that Mark Stromberg